If you can read a clock, you can know the time of day. But no one knows what time itself is. We cannot see it. We cannot touch it. We cannot hear it. We know it only by the way we mark its passing. For all our success in measuring the smallest parts of time, time remains one of the great mysteries of the universe. One way to think about time is to imagine a world without time. There could be no movement because time and movement cannot be separated. A world without time could exist only as long as there were no changes, for time and change are linked. We know that time has passed when something changes. In the real world, the world with time, changes never stop. Some changes happen only once in a while, like an eclipse of the moon. Others happen repeatedly, like the rising and setting of the sun. Humans always have noted natural events that repeat themselves. When people began to count such events, they began to measure time. In early human history, the only changes that seemed to repeat themselves evenly were the movements of objects in the sky. The most easily seen result of these movements was the difference between light and darkness. The sun rises in the eastern sky, producing light. It moves across the sky and sinks in the west, causing darkness. The appearance and disappearance of the sun was even and unfailing. The periods of light and darkness it created were the first accepted periods of time. We have named each period of light and darkness one day. People saw the sun rise higher in the sky during the summer than in winter. They counted the days that passed from the sun's highest position until it returned to that position. They counted 365 days. We now know that is the time Earth takes to move once around the sun. We call this period of time a year. Early humans also noted changes in the moon. As it moved across the night sky, they must have wondered, why did it look different every night? Why did it disappear? Where did it go? Even before they learned the answers to these questions, they developed a way to use the changing faces of the moon to tell time. The moon was full when its face was bright and round. The early humans counted the number of times the sun appeared between full moons. They learned that this number always remained the same, about twenty-nine suns. Twenty-nine suns equaled one moon. We now know this period of time as one month. Early humans hunted animals and gathered wild plants. They moved in groups or tribes from place to place in search of food. Then people learned to plant seeds and grow crops. They learned to use animals to help them work and for food. They found they no longer needed to move from one place to another to survive. As hunters, people did not need a way to measure time. As farmers, however, 
they had to plant crops in time to harvest them before winter. They had to know when the seasons would change. So they developed calendars. No one knows when the first calendar was developed, but it seems possible that it was based on moons or lunar months. When people started farming, the wise men of the tribes became very important. They studied the sky. They gathered enough information so they could know when the seasons would change. They announced when it was time to plant crops. The divisions of time we use today were developed in ancient Babylonia 4,000 years ago. Babylonian astronomers believed the sun moved around the earth every 365 days. They divided the trip into 12 equal parts or months. Each month was 30 days. Then, they divided each day into twenty-four equal parts, or hours. They divided each hour into sixty minutes, and each minute into sixty seconds. Humans have used many devices to measure time. The sundial was one of the earliest and simplest. A sundial measures the movement of the sun across the sky each day. It has a stick or other object that rises above a flat surface. The stick, blocking sunlight, creates a shadow. As the sun moves, so does the shadow of the stick across the flat surface. Marks on the surface show the passing of hours and perhaps minutes. The sundial works well only when the sun is shining. So other ways were invented to measure the passing of time. One device is the hourglass. It uses a thin stream of falling sand to measure time. The hourglass is shaped like the number eight wide at the top and bottom, but very thin in the middle. In a true hourglass, it takes exactly one hour for all the sand to drop from the top to the bottom through a very small opening in the middle. When the hourglass is turned with the upside down, it begins to mark the passing of another hour. By the 18th century, people had developed mechanical clocks and watches, and today many of our clocks and watches are electronic. So we have devices to mark the passing of time. But what time is it now? Clocks in different parts of the world do not show the same time at the same time. This is because time on Earth is set by the sun's position in the sky above. We all have a 12 o'clock noon each day. Noon is the time the sun is highest in the sky. But when it is 12 o'clock noon where I am, it may be 10 o'clock at night where you are. As international communications and travel increased, it became clear that it would be necessary to establish a common time for all parts of the world. In 1884, an international conference divided the world into 24 time areas, or zones, each zone represents one hour. The Astronomical Observatory in Greenwich, England, was chosen as the starting point for the time zones. Twelve zones are west of Greenwich. 
twelve are east. The time at Greenwich, as measured by the sun, is called universal time. For many years, it was called Greenwich Mean Time. Some scientists say time is governed by the movement of matter in our universe. They say time flows forward because the universe is expanding. Some say it will stop expanding some day, and will begin to move in the opposite direction, to grow smaller. Some believe time will also begin to flow in the opposite direction. From the future to the past, can time move backward? Most people have no trouble agreeing that time moves forward. We see people born and then grow old. We remember the past, but we do not know the future. We know a film is moving forward if it shows a glass falling off a table and breaking into many pieces. If the film were moving backward, the pieces would rejoin to form a glass and jump back up onto the table. No one has ever seen this happen, except in a film. Some scientists believe there is one reason why time only moves forward. It is a well-known scientific law. The second law of thermodynamics. That law says disorder increases with time. In fact, there are more conditions of disorder than of order. For example, there are many ways a glass can break into pieces. That is disorder. But there is only one way the broken pieces can be organized. To make a glass, that is order. If time moved backward, the broken pieces could come together in a great many ways. Only one of these many ways, however, would reform the glass. It is almost impossible to believe this would happen. Not all scientists believe time is governed by the second law of thermodynamics. They do not agree that time must always move forward. The debate will continue about the nature of time, and time will remain a mystery. So you want to travel by plane, right? It's just natural to be a little worried because sometimes there are things that can prevent us from getting on time. I almost missed the plane in several occasions, and after that, I became more responsible. Nowadays, I can say that I plan my plane trip more efficiently. The night before the trip, I make sure that the flight is confirmed because it can get delayed or even cancelled due to bad weather. I book my flights online. I book a one-way ticket when I don't want to return to my destination right away. However, I usually book a round-trip ticket, which includes a return ticket too. And I'm not in the habit of checking in my luggage when I travel. Airlines usually allow us to check up to two suitcases. Nonetheless, I like traveling only with my carry-on luggage and a small backpack where I keep my passport, the ID, and boarding pass. Since I don't check the luggage when I travel, I'm allowed to check in online. So when I arrive at the airport, I already have my boarding card printed out. Like I told you. There are always unexpected things that can happen, so I prefer to be on time. I usually arrive two hours early at the airport, and from there I start my adventure to the boarding gate. When we have to catch a plane, timing is everything. But for some reason, some of us tend to arrive later than planned. One time, I arrived at the airport five hours early. 
Naturally, I figured I had all the time in the world, so I walked slowly towards the gate. From time to time, I stopped to buy some souvenirs. When all of a sudden, I realized I was way too late. In fact, that time I had to run fast so I wouldn't miss the plane. You must have guessed by now that airports make me feel uneasy. There are several terminals which are sometimes located miles away from each other. Besides. Arrivals and departures are usually situated on different floors. Another downside, particularly in large airports, is that you'll run into many distractions. There are some of the best fashion brands, delicious food and drinks, and even a place where they provide foot and back massages. On one occasion, after walking around the airport, I saw a place where they were doing foot massages. Unfortunately, I didn't have time to stop because I was again running late. But I must admit, I was very tempted. And what about going through security? Everything moves so fast. You have to take off your belt and shoes, your jacket. You need to check your pockets to see if you left any coins or keys. You should make sure that the liquids are placed in a separate plastic bag. And yes, the laptop. You'll have to take your laptop out of the luggage, and after all this fuss, it's time to board. So start looking for your boarding gate. You usually know the number of the gate because it's on your boarding pass, but make sure you double check this information on the departure boards. One time, I was happily waiting in front of my gate when I suddenly realized that my gate had changed. And I almost missed my flight that time because the new gate was some miles away from where I was. But wait, the fun's not over yet. After the plane has landed, there are some extra steps that you need to take. If you've checked your luggage, you'll have to pick it up from the baggage claim. Before you're allowed to enter another country, you must go through customs. Here, they'll check if you're carrying anything illegal, such as firearms, drugs, or too much money. They'll ask you if you have anything to declare, and if you're not carrying anything that's forbidden, you'll need to answer no. Let's see some vocabulary. To board a plane. Means to go onto it. A boarding pass shows where the plane will be boarding and your seat number. Carry-on luggage. The carry-on luggage is the small piece of hand luggage that you're allowed to take with you onto the plane. Check-in. When you check in, you notify the airline that you arrived at the airport. They will take your suitcase and hand you a boarding pass. Conveyor belt or carousel or baggage claim. It's where you pick up your bag after you arrived at your destination. Customs. Before entering another country, you'll need to go through customs. They just want to make sure you're not carrying anything illegal, such as firearms, drugs, or too much money. Departures, gate, and arrivals. When you arrive at your destination. Your friends will meet you at the arrivals lounge. One-way ticket. When you don't want to return to your destination, you buy a one-way ticket. Return ticket. A return ticket is the opposite of a one-way ticket. And a round-trip ticket is when you purchase the one-way ticket and the return ticket together. Nowadays, more and more people are adopting animals, and pet ownership in the states is on the rise. I had a dog some time ago, which was a beautiful experience. The connection between dog and its owner is always special, especially when you take them for a walk. A dog needs to go for long walks to be able to connect with you. Some assume you must give them their favorite treat to win them over. 
But that link happens when you take them out for a walk. There are few things like the unconditional love of a dog. It's a unique feeling when you come home after a stressful day and know that your dog is waiting for you, always happy to welcome you. In America, dogs are the favorite pet. Almost 40% of households have at least one dog as a pet. However, before adopting one, you should keep in mind that it requires training, daily walks, etc. In addition, owning a dog in the States is costly. Dog owners spend more than $1,000 yearly on vet checkups, medications, and medical supplies. But, as I was saying, the relationship with a dog is rewarding. And if you haven't had a positive experience with your dog, it's probably due to a lack of understanding. The first time you adopt a dog, you learn on the fly how to handle it. In any case, I encourage you to try again. But if you're not yet ready for this, I totally understand. Although I've been fortunate with my dog, because he was really sweet and obedient, I'm not yet considering adopting another one. Now you may wonder which is better, buying or adopting a dog. Although there is nothing wrong with either option, adopted animals seem to be very grateful. And since I've never had a cat, I can't speak much from personal experience. But I have some friends who adopted a cat a few months ago, and they are delighted with a furry animal. Besides, cats require much less maintenance because they are more independent. Even so, a cat is still a great companion. In the States, cats are the second most preferred pet. And unlike dogs, cats don't need daily walks and are happy to entertain themselves. Okay, now we know a little more about pets. <music> Having a pet at home helps relieve stress. Does having a pet help increase stress? No, it doesn't help increase stress. It helps relieve and reduce stress. What helps relieve a stressful life? Having a pet at home, that helps relieve stress. What do you need to have at home to feel calmer? A computer? A pet. You need to have a pet at home. Where do you need to have the pet? At home. You need to have it at home. Pets help reduce the feelings of loneliness because they keep us company. What do pets help reduce? The feeling of loneliness. They help us reduce the feeling of loneliness because they keep us company. Who keeps us company? Pets. Pets keep us company. Why do pets 
help us reduce the feeling of loneliness. Because they keep us company. That's why they help us. A dog at home helps us stay active since we have to walk it. Does having a dog help us to lie on the couch all day? No, no. It doesn't help us lie on the couch. It helps us stay active. Does a dog help us get fitter? Yes. It helps us get fitter. We have to walk it. And so, it helps us stay more active. What do we have to do? We have to walk the dog. We have to walk it. Why does it help us stay active? We stay active because we have to walk the dog. A dog helps us have a better social life because we interact with other dog owners. Does a dog help us talk to people more? Yes, it helps us talk to people more because we interact with other dog owners. Who do we interact with if we have a dog? Other dogs? No, not with other dogs. We interact with other dog owners, that is, with people. Do we have a worse social life when we have a dog? No, no, we don't have a worse social life. A dog helps us to have a better social life. Caring for a pet increases the sense of responsibility in both children and adults. What does a pet increase? The sense of responsibility. Caring for a pet increases the sense of responsibility. What increases the sense of responsibility? Taking care of a pet. Does it increase the sense of responsibility in children? Yes, it increases the sense of responsibility in children. And in adults? Yes, also in adults, it increases the sense of responsibility. That is, we are more responsible thanks to caring for a pet. Okay, that's the end of this short exercise. If you find it difficult, that's normal. I recommend you repeat it several times, and if you want, on several different days. It is that time of year again. Warm weather has returned to Earth's northern hemisphere. Summer is a time when people of all ages feel like getting their swimwear 
and going to the nearest swimming pool or seashore. But first, there is that troublesome little thing called winter weight gain. Many of us gain weight because of inactivity during the winter. Some people go to extremes to lose that extra weight before going to the beach. In the weight loss industry, there is never a lack of ideas about how to lose weight. Consider the Sleeping Beauty diet, where you sleep your way to weight loss. You cannot eat if you are sleeping, or so the theory goes. Then there is the tapeworm diet. The tapeworm is said to help people lose weight by eating the food that is stored in their stomach. But first, you have to be willing to swallow the little creature. This may be more trouble than many people want. Strange new diets, treatments, and exercise programs arrive on the market every day. Each one promises to help people lose weight and get a beach beautiful body. The weight loss industry takes in billions of dollars each year, and it is growing. One research company says the weight loss business will be worth more than $580 billion worldwide by the year 2014. Markets and Markets also says the food and drink market represents the largest part of that growth. It is expected to reach more than $355 billion by 2014. There is a seemingly endless supply of ideas about how to lose weight. There are low-carbohydrate diets and low-fat diets, diets that limit calories and ones that let you eat as much as you want. And there are thousands of different kinds of diet pills and programs. So, where does one begin? Which one is best? Experts say there is no single diet plan that works best for everyone. Many experts agree on one thing, that to lose weight, you must use or burn off more calories than you take in. When you eat more calories than your body needs, it stores that extra energy as fat. Calories are a measure of energy in food. A pound of fat is equal to about 453 grams or 3,500 calories. To lose that fat in a week, you have to burn off at least that amount in calories or eat that much less. The best thing to do is to combine both ideas. Eat fewer calories and increase physical activity so that you burn off more. America's National Institutes of Health has suggested that women limit calories to no less than 1,200 calories a day without medical supervision. It also says men should have no less than 1,500 calories. Debate continues about the best way to fill those calorie requirements. For years, eating a diet low in fat was said to be the best way to lose weight. A low-fat diet is one in which less than 30% of a person's daily calorie intake comes from fat. Dean Ornish developed one of the most popular low-fat diets after years of research on ways to control heart disease. His dietary ideas were first published in the medical journal The Lancet in 1990. The Ornish diet plan became more popular in 1993 with the release of his book, Eat More, Weigh Less. Dr. Ornish studied the effects of carbohydrates, 
one of the most important sources of energy for the body. He found that carbohydrates were not to blame for making people fat. Instead, he said, fat makes people fat. He noted that a baked potato is not high in fat, but it becomes fatty when people add sour cream and butter to it. Dr. Ornish's diet plan limits daily calories from fat to less than 10%, with little to no saturated fat or cholesterol. He also suggested that people get 70 to 75 percent of their calories from complex carbohydrates and 15 to 20 percent from proteins. Like other low-fat diets, the Ornish plan suggests that people eat diets high in whole grains, fruits, vegetables, beans, and other legumes. The plan advises people to avoid all meat and meat products and to stay away from oils, nuts, and seeds. It does not limit the number of calories people eat. But eating the food suggested by the diet plan would reduce the number of calories. The Ornish diet has proved to be effective for many people. However, critics say it lets dieters eat too many carbohydrates while setting restrictions on calories from fat. They also say the changes required in eating habits may be too extreme for many people to follow. Unlike the Ornish diet, low-carbohydrate diets limit foods that are high in carbohydrates. These diets advise people to avoid things like white flour, pasta, rice, potatoes, and foods high in sugar. Instead, they suggest that people eat foods that are high in proteins and fats. These include foods like meat, fish, chicken, eggs, cheese, and nuts. The Atkins diet is one of the most popular of these diets. It suggests that people eat fewer than 20 grams of carbohydrates a day. This amount is slowly increased to between 40 and 100 grams of carbohydrates a day to keep the weight off. Both weight loss plans have been carefully studied over the years. But no one plan has come out as a clear winner. Three years ago, a study in the New England Journal of Medicine found low-carb diets to be the best at providing the most weight loss. The study was led by researchers at the Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston and Ben-Gurion University in Israel. The researchers studied more than 300 obese patients who followed one of three diet plans. These included a low-fat diet, a low-carb diet, and a Mediterranean diet, which is made up of fruits, vegetables, lean proteins, olive oil, and nuts. A similar study published a year later looked at more than 800 dieters. The study found that low-fat diets and high-fat diets were equally successful at providing and maintaining weight loss over a two-year period. The researchers concluded that the most important thing for any diet is that people stick with it. And you must burn more calories than you take in, no matter what you eat. Some people are unable to lose weight through diet and exercise, no matter how hard they try. Others are just not willing to put in the effort. Many of these people choose to have surgical operations to reach their weight loss goals. One kind of weight loss surgery reduces the size of the stomach. This is done by separating the stomach into two parts, 
including a very small section at the top. People who have had this operation are forced to eat smaller amounts of food because their top stomach fills up much faster. Research suggests that most people lose about half of their overweight pounds in the first year after surgery. However, a large number of people regain the weight in three to five years. A new report suggests similar results for another popular weight loss surgery. Liposuction has been widely used since the 1970s to improve the body's appearance. It improves body shape by removing fat from certain parts of the body. The most common areas are the stomach, waist, hips, thighs, neck, and arms. The International Society of Aesthetic Plastic Surgery says liposuction is the most popular form of cosmetic surgery worldwide. Recently, researchers at the University of Colorado School of Medicine found that the effects of the surgery may not be long-lasting. They said people who have liposuction usually experience weight gain within one year after the surgery. And the fat that comes back reappears in a new area of the body, most noticeably the shoulders, arms, and upper abdomen. The researchers say this is one more reason to try to prevent obesity before it happens.